Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the Solid State Physics in a Nutshell podcast series. My name is Eric Tober. And I'm Nicole Johnson. We've made these videos to go with Cattell's Solid State Physics book, and our hope is that these videos will provide you with a resource that you can watch over and over to your heart's content. Often in Solid State, we care about properties, stuff like magnetism and superconductivity. But to get to these properties, we need to understand the underlying structure of solids. Today we're going to start with covalent bonding in solids, as this is the basis of so many important materials. Mm, it sounds a bit tricky. Maybe we could start by looking at covalent bonds in a hydrogen gas molecule, hit it repeatedly with some quantum, and take that result and apply it to solids. Sounds good. Hopefully that quantum won't hit you back. Let's start with an H2 plus molecule, so just one electron and two protons. What assumptions do you want to make? Right off the bat, I'm going to assume our two hydrogen nuclei are fixed in space so that the electron is the only thing free to move. For the moment, I'll put one nuclei over here and the other way over here. Then we can bring them together and maybe even watch a bond form. So you'll develop an expression for the energy of each atom on its own and observe the change in the system's energy based on the exchange that happens as the atoms are brought closer together. Exactly. First, we'll start with our time-independent Schrodinger equation, so, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm using the Brock head notation. If you're not familiar with it, maybe you should let Eric know. So what do you want to use for the electron's wave function? Well, what we can do is build the wave function from a summation of all possible states in our system. And since we only have two atoms, the wave function is made up of a whopping two states each with its own weighing coefficient, Ca and Cb. And the states phi A and phi B represent the states of the isolated hydrogen atoms that we're bringing closer together? Right. Taking this now and shoving it through our Schrodinger's equation yields this somewhat complicated equation. And from this, we can develop two secular equations by taking the inner product once with phi A and once with phi B. These two equations are nice in the sense that now everything is either an integral or a constant. Hmm, this doesn't look much prettier. In fact, there's a lot of unknowns floating around, and that makes me a little nervous. You're right. Let's see what we have so far. We ultimately want to solve for the energy in terms of the wave functions phi a and phi b, as well as the system Hamiltonian. That leaves these coefficients left to deal with. Since we have two equations and two unknowns, Sounds like a job for linear algebra. Indeed, and we're left with two solutions. On the one hand, we have the trivial solution for Ca and Cb equals zero, but that gives us a null wave function, and that has no physical significance. On the other hand, we have non-trivial solutions to Ca and Cb by making the determinant of this matrix equal to zero, and we solve for the energy that way. After doing this, we end up with an expression for the energy of our system. For this case, we're going to pick the states, phi a and phi b, such that they are orthogonal, which makes this bottom term disappear. This leaves the energy as the sum of an on-site interaction, plus or minus the exchange term. This exchange term is pretty critical. It describes the interaction of the two atomic wave functions via the system's Hamiltonian. The exchange term also leads to an energy splitting where we have two energy levels. So we can see that the exchange term is driving the formation of bonds. If the energy is greater than the non-bonded case, we'd call that the antibonding state. You got it. To drive the point further, let's plot our wave function and electron density for both cases. Let's start with bonding. So on the top, we have a wave function like so. And on the bottom, we have psi star psi which gives us an electron density that looks like this. Ah, now I see that there's a charge buildup in the electron density between the two atoms, indicating the probability of finding the electron is high in this region. Nicole, it's also important to note that since the charge pileup is in the space between the atoms, we call this a covalent bond. This is the quantum version of the sharing that you're familiar with from Gen Chem. Now let's look at the antibonding case. Okay. Ah, the wave function here has a positive part and a negative part. So when you take psi star psi, you get a truly zero value for the electron density between the two atoms. So now if we take our expression for the bonding and antibonding energies, 
and plot them as a function of distance between the two atoms. We first off can see there's no splitting at large r, because at that point the atoms are still isolated. But as they're brought closer together, the energies start to split. What may not be inherently obvious is the sharp rise here on the left. Have any guesses, Nicole? Well, as you start to push them closer than their equilibrium distance, you'll start to see coulombic repulsion. The more you try to push them together, the more they'll repel each other, which is why the energy rises sharply. Bingo. And in atoms where we have core states, we also have to think about the Pauli exclusion principle. Overlapping the core states of two atoms will further increase this rise in energy. Why don't we move over to helium? It seems simple like hydrogen, so why don't we see bonding between helium atoms? Well, I know as the helium atoms get closer together, there will be a split in energy levels just like hydrogen. Because each helium atom has two electrons, there are now four electrons in the system, and they'll populate both the bonding and antibonding states. And the combination of the two should give us a minimal net driving force, which basically results in no bonding. You know, Eric, I'm feeling pretty good about bonding in a gas molecule. Bring on the solids. All right, let's start with carbon as an example. It likes to form in the diamond structure and has s, px, py, and pz orbitals. So from the molecular orbital approach, it would seem like carbon would have six nearest neighbors. But we know diamond is a four-coordinate structure. Yeah, you're right to be confused. This isn't really obvious. We'll need to introduce another concept called hybridization. In quantum, when we developed the atomic orbitals, we assumed that the atom was isolated and in a vacuum, right? Right, but in a real solid, that isn't the case. Exactly. In hybridization, these atomic orbitals reconstitute themselves into different orbitals. And you can see how we go from the original s and p orbitals to new hybrid orbitals from this table. So the values in the table are just weighing factors for the original s and p orbitals? Bingo. And in the case of carbon, it's s and 3p orbitals hybridized into four sp3 orbitals that form a tetrahedra. Each of these hybrid orbitals will look like this. So as we bring two carbon atoms close together, these two lobes will align, and that's where we'll see our covalent bond. Absolutely. And from this we can see how this diamond structure is generated. And again, here's the resulting tetrahedra. We can also use more advanced techniques to visualize this charge pileup due to covalent bonding. So what hybridization might you see for the graphene structure? Well, I can see that carbon forms three bonds in the plane, so the hybridization would be three sp2 orbitals. But since we came in with four orbitals, we're short the pz orbital. Yeah, it turns out that one sticks out of the sheet. Here, the adjacent pz orbitals also bond with each other. In gen chem, we would call these pi bonds. That makes a lot of sense. So it's looking about time to recap today's video. One, we started with a one electron system. And after some assumptions, we were able to describe covalent bonding in a H2 plus gas. Two, from quantum, we were also able to describe the system energy splitting in terms of an exchange term between the two atoms in our system. Ah, don't forget we also looked at two carbon-based solids and described why hybridization is critical in their structure. But before we leave, Eric, I suggest we pose some questions to our viewers. While we looked at elemental systems, it would be good to think about compounds composed of different materials, like, say, gallium arsenide. What would bonding look like in this material, and how would you know? Nicole mentioned earlier that we fixed the position of the hydrogen nuclei and let the electrons zoom around. In a real solid, would you expect these electrons' wave functions to be localized or extended throughout the material? And finally, we talked about sp3 and sp2 hybridization. What type of geometry would result in sp hybridization? So that concludes covalent bonding in solids. Next time, Nicole and I will be delving into different types of bonding, and what forces drive each. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.